Good morning, everybody. My name is Brent, one of the elders here at Pathway, and I want to wish a warm welcome to everyone here, both our members and our guests. It's a beautiful day to worship. We're thankful to be together. Uh, we just got a couple announcements, and then uh, we'll get right into singing our gathering songs. Uh, so first of all, uh, as a church, we have been raising funds for Soraya's family, Fatima, and, and, uh, and the others. And um, I'm so happy to share with you guys that uh, of our $16,000 goal, we have $17,000 so far. Uh, so praise God for that. That's truly amazing. It's an update from this morning. Um, and we just, I just wanted to share from the deacons that um, it doesn't mean that we've yet completely met our goal. Like we can surpass it because I know Soraya has borrowed a lot of money. Um, and so any, anything we can do to still support her will we'll go on to help even further and also support the family when they arrive. So praise God for that. And uh, yeah, it's great to see prayers answered. Uh, second of all, uh, we are welcoming from our sister church in Willoughby, Pastor uh, Carlo Jansen, who will be leading us in worship today. Uh, we're very thankful he could join us, and we hope you uh, feel at home with us today. So let's rise and sing our two gathering songs.
O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, and so ascribe power to God. As we lift up our hearts to the Lord in worship, we confess our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And this God greets us with his blessing, grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together hymn 29. may be seated. As we gather in the worship of the triune God, it's good to reflect on who we ourselves are. As humans, we were created to be God's image, to reflect who God is. God is a God of love and loyalty, and he wants us to be people of love and and faithfulness. And what that looks like, God has made clear to us in his law. Let's now hear God's law to understand what the Lord requires of us. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and for us in today's terms, that slavery to evil. And so God says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship me as I command you. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Use God's name to add power to your own words. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day, the day of rest, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath, is a rest to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. And why? Well, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see in all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet, desire your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey, anything that is your neighbor's. The scripture makes clear that love is the fulfillment of God's law. And that love is also characterized for us as follows. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It isn't irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, says Scripture, never ends. Now, when we reflect on our lives in the light of what we've just heard, we come to realize that we fall short in many ways. We didn't do the good we were called to do, and we did many of the things we shouldn't have been doing. And so sin remains with us. We confess with the psalmist, Psalm 69, you know, God, my folly, my guilt is not hidden from you, Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads for we have sinned. But we approach your throne of grace in the name of the Savior whom you gave us, Jesus the Christ. And Lord, we pray, do not hold our guilt against us, but forgive us. Cleanse us with the blood and spirit of Christ. And we pray at this time, Lord, for those who have known of you but are turning their backs to you. Those who figure they can worship and serve you as they please, not as pleases you. Those who deny you, walking in ways of selfishness. Father, grant repentance where there is need of that. So that together we may live for the glory of your name. Hear us, Heavenly Father. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Psalm 69 speaks of confessing our sins. But it also assures us that those who have truly confessed their sins from the heart are forgiven and may walk in God's ways. The poor, says the psalmist, will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. And so be assured, as you are in Christ, so we are cleansed with the blood of Christ, acceptable to God, and strive to walk in God's ways. Amen. Let's sing now. From Psalm 31. Psalm 31 I've chosen at this time. It sings of the enmity that we experience in life. Our enmity with evil. But it also speaks to the topic of the sermon. Where we'll be focusing on the enmity that Jesus Christ encountered. As he entered into his suffering. Psalm 31.
All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we praise you for your goodness and mercy. The beautiful sunshine brings warmth to our souls and a constant reminder of your greatness and control of all things. We live in a place surrounded by beauty, from the towering mountains to open blue skies and vast oceans surrounding us. You created it all with a word, and you placed us in it. Lord, hear our praise and awe and wonder of our good, great, and gracious God. Yet, Lord, there are many times that we fall short of who we were created to be. Many times we fell into sin's trap and lost our way. None of us can hold the standard of perfection set by your Son, Jesus Christ, the perfect, selfless standard, a sacrificial love that is hard to fathom, a comfort that surrounds us that goes unmatched. May we revel in your love. May we fall to our knees and humbly ask you for forgiveness, knowing how we've fallen short, but that by your grace and the sacrifice of your Son, we are forgiven. We are your children, chosen by you to spend eternity with you, praising you and worshiping your holy name. Lord, what a joy and comfort this is. Thank you for this gospel and for your holy word where we can continue to connect and learn through you. We give you thanks, Lord, that we can come together to worship here at Pathway in Freedom. We thank you for our sister Canadian Reformed Churches throughout the valley and that we have the opportunity to hear from Reverend Jansen today. We pray that you would bless his church in Willoughby, that they may flourish, grow in their faith, and grow in numbers of those that come to know Christ. Please be with him here as he preaches your word. May your spirit flow through him as he delivers the message, and may our hearts be receptive and our thoughts and actions apply what we have learned. Lord, we also thank you for our care groups, our youth groups, catechism classes, outreach opportunities, leadership, and all those who work tirelessly behind the scenes here at Pathway. It takes many parts to make a whole, and you've blessed us with many skills and abilities. Please give strength to those who need it in their roles right now. Please help them to feel edified and joyful where you have placed them. Lord, please also open the hearts and minds of those looking to be more involved. Please open doors and our hearts to want to serve you and our local churches in a selfless way. That way we can show up to bless others and bring those who don't know you to Christ and uplift and support our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. In Care Group, we discussed opportunities to stand up for our faith, to proclaim our faith in our walks, at work, at school, and in the secular world around us. Lord, let us not shy away from these opportunities. May our light shine bright, and may we be bold and courageous to openly seek opportunities to grow your kingdom and find that one lost sheep that we may be able to have an impact on. We don't know your plans for us and those around us in our lives, but we do know you control all things and you can use us in the smallest of ways to make the biggest of differences. Please open these doors, guide our speech and actions as we go from here and live our daily lives. Father, Sarai's family has the opportunity to come to Canada. What a joy and blessing this is. You've heard our prayers. You've answered our calls. Now, Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless the fundraising efforts, that the amount can be achieved and surpassed, and Fatima and the rest of Sarai's family may find sanctuary in Canada among us. Please be with those among us who have serious illnesses. There are cancers and other sicknesses, not only of our members, but close loved ones, and there are many trials that go along with that. Please surround these families with endless support from their loved ones and from this body of believers. Please also grant healing and a comfort that can only come from you. Lord, we also lift in prayer the Heisman and Rollman family with the passing of Albert Rollman and Gerda Heisman yesterday. Lord, many of us know them. There's some of us that are related to them, and we lift up these families to you, that you would surround them with your comfort and bless them. And Lord, we also pray for Angelina's brother, Mario, who's in Sudan and is quite sick. He's coughing up blood, but we're not sure um, what, what his health situation is yet, but we do pray for healing and medicine for him. We lift him up in prayer. Lord, we also praise you for the engagement of Ashley Behrens and Mitch Bergsma. It is our prayer that they may continue to grow in their faith and closer to Jesus, and through that relationship, closer to each other as they plan and prepare life together. Lord, there are many couples in this church that are engaged right now, and we thank you for this gift, and we pray that you would bless these couples as they get ready for their upcoming weddings. The amazing part of a church body is all the different walks of life that come together in need of a day of rest, from old to young, resting in your word, praising you together, and supporting one another. Lord, please be with our children, that they may grow up to truly know their Father and Savior. Please be with the young adults, give them discernment, discipline, and a yearning to grow in their faith. Please be with the singles among us. Lord, provide them with a life partner, if that is what they're hoping for, and may they feel your love from week to week. 
Please also be with the young parents who need patience, as it's hard to see much past the next day at a time. Thank you for the gift of new children and of raising them. We know we need you to walk alongside each phase of our lives, Lord, and may we turn to you in the hard times. Please also be with the elderly, that they can remain in good health and have a huge impact in leadership and mentorship for those who walk with them. Thank you for this group of people, Lord. May we be a blessing to each other and connect through the message today. And as mentioned earlier, in you we find our rest. May we all go from here knowing that today, no matter what is placed in our path this week, we have the Trinity on our side, God the Father, Jesus the Son who died for our sins, and the Spirit who has been placed on us in our daily lives. Under this lens, help us to let the small problems be small problems, not to consume our time, mental capacity, and worry. Let us not be anxious, but truly find rest in you this week. Please bless everyone as they leave here to be in their Bibles, in prayer, and being active, living advocates for Christ. Amen. We'll now uh, have the offering, and uh, this morning it is for the work of the deacons. Before we continue on into scripture reading and the preaching, just want to say on a personal note, it's a privilege to be here. Those of you who are somewhat new to Pathway may have wondered why did the lead elder not really introduce a guest pastor. That's because I used to be a pastor in Abbotsford and I probably know about two-thirds of the people here personally already and it's good to see many familiar faces it's also good to see very many stranger faces. It's good to be together in this way. Our scripture reading is from Mark chapter 14 and John chapter 13. Mark sets the context a little bit for the text, and John 13 gives us some background details to the things that we'll encounter in the text. So let's read that together. In God's Word, we read... Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. 
When they heard it, and they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And then in John chapter 13, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed doesn't need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. 
If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I, I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. The text for the sermon is from Mark chapter 14, the verses 17 through 21, where we read, And when it was evening, he, that's Jesus, came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Let's bow our heads and seek God's blessing over the preaching. Heavenly God, Eternal Father, we have opened your word, we have read your word, we've heard you speak. And now one of your servants is to speak. Will you bless the preaching that we hear? May it touch us. May it instruct us in our minds. May it shape our love for you in our hearts. And may it spur us on to live to your honor and glory. May your spirit attend us as we hear good news proclaimed. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, and guests, it's one thing to know that all things are in God's hands. Nothing happens outside of His control, that's another thing to, to ponder the implications of that and observe God's plan being executed. And especially as we, during this time of the year, think about God's salvation for this world, we're confronted with that. When humanity willfully rebelled against God, when, when we plunged ourselves into this state of selfishness at the expense of God, at the expense of other humans, and even of all creation, God responded by putting enmity in place. Enmity, he describes in Genesis 3, between the serpent and humanity, enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Enmity, basically between evil and good. Through enmity, God would preserve and save his people. And so God declared war on evil to bring about well-being. Now, as humans, we'd figure, oh God, you should have destroyed Satan there and then, restored humanity, everything would have been good. But it wouldn't have been. It wasn't like God wasn't able to do that. He is God. He's all-powerful. But he did not have the right. God's justice had to be satisfied. Evil had gained the right to bite the heel of humanity. But God did promise, in spite of that bite, humanity will crush the head of evil. And the text we've just read confronts us with the start of what you might call the decisive battle between good and evil between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The seed of the woman, 
That's the Son of Man. That's the Son of God who took on human flesh. That's Jesus Christ. And the seed of the serpent, that's in our text. Now Judas Iscariot. John 13 verse 2 says that the devil had put it into Judas' heart to betray Jesus. Judas had already made his deal with the Jewish leadership. He was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus and to cash in. And so in our text, the decisive battle is being staged. And we want to see this morning how God brings about salvation through enmity. That's the message of the sermon, salvation through enmity. And as we travel our way through the text, we're going to see the confidence of the Son of Man. We'll see the concern of the 12 disciples. And then we'll note the determination of God. First, the confidence of the Son of Man, of Jesus. Boys and girls, I want you to imagine two sports teams. Two hockey teams, two soccer teams, volleyball teams, doesn't matter. They're about to have a match. And now imagine that the coach of one of those two teams knows exactly what's going to happen during the game. What skills the, the players on the other team have. What plays the other team is going to make. What substitutes will be made and, and when. You know, coaches, they dream of knowing that sort of stuff. The better you know the opposing team, uh, the better you can position your own team to win. And now if you could also know exactly what will happen during the game. Now that's of course unheard of. Coaches spend an awful lot of time trying to imagine possible scenarios and preparing their team for it. But they don't know what's going to happen. Or imagine a war. A war between two countries. And the commander-in-chief of one of the two countries knows exactly what's going to happen during the war, during which battles. You know, these days we can know a lot. We've got satellites and drones and, and radar planes and that sort of thing. But imagine if you knew exactly what was going to happen when. All the way to the end of the battle. Indeed, all the way to the end of the war. And now realize, as the Son of God took on human flesh and he became the Son of Man, he knew. He knew exactly what would happen, how it would happen, when it would happen. And in fact, not only he knew, much of it could have been known by others as well. For it had been known since evil had gained influence in our world. Not only had God put enmity in this world, God had also promised that the devil would seriously hurt humanity, but that humanity would ultimately conquer evil. Genesis 3 verse 15, if we could put that up on the slide. God had said to the Satan-possessed serpent, you will crush his heel and he will crush, bruise your head. Now, throughout the course of human history, God revealed much more about the war on evil. And especially on the decisive battle with evil. One such instance of revelation is the Feast of Passover. That was celebrated by the Israelites once every year in the spring, two weeks into their new year. Their, their new year would begin um, at the new moon that would start March. And then Passover would be at the full moon. And God had commanded Leviticus 23, next slide, in the first month of the year then, on the 14th day of the month, so that's halfway, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Now Passover was celebrated for, with a view to the liberation of the Israelite people from slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt. And that, that liberation, that's not just... You know, one people escaping the rule of another people. No, the king of, of Egypt and the gods of Egypt had a hold on God's people. And so this became a battle between good and evil. Pharaoh 
that's the king of Egypt, he had determined that the enslaved Israelites would not be let go. And so Yahweh El Shaddai, that's the Lord God Almighty, he took on the authorities of Egypt. He took on both the human authorities and the spiritual authorities through a series of 10 plagues. And each of those plagues has a spiritual side to it. The ninth plague, for example, that was three days of darkness, was a stab at the upper god of the Egyptians, Ra. He was the god of light. Well, God said, I'm turning him off. God, Yahweh, canceled Ra. And the tenth plague was a stab at Egypt's existence as a nation. The oldest male offspring of humans and animals were all killed in one night. Basically, Egypt's authority structure was torn to shreds. And so here we have a picture of the kingdom of darkness crushing the heel of God's humanity. Israel was enslaved. And there's a picture of the kingdom of light crushing devil's humanity. Egypt suffers defeat as Israel was set free. And Passover was the Feast of Liberation. It told the Israelites something about God's war on evil. It was also the feast of becoming God's possession. It announced that the tenth plague, the death of all the firstborn male offsprings of humans and animals, would impact not just Egyptians, but everyone, also the Israelites. Well, by nature, the Israelites were, of course, no better than the Egyptians. They had succumbed to the influence of the Egyptians. They were worshiping the same false gods. And so the tenth plague was used by God as an opportunity for the Israelites to express their faith, their confidence in God. They were to believe that God would indeed judge the people and kill the firstborn. But they also had to believe that if they followed God's instruction by painting the doorposts with the blood of a lamb, their house would be spared. And so the blood of the lamb saved those who covered it from death. From the curse which God had placed on, on human life when humanity rebelled against God. The people in the house who hid behind the blood of the Passover lamb had now been bought by God. And so God liberated for himself a people from the kingdom of darkness and he transferred them into his own kingdom. The Passover feast celebrated literally what the English name for this feast says. The passing over of God's people. First of all, the angel of death passed over the houses that were covered with the blood of the lamb. And the people passed over out of Egypt as the house of slavery to evil. Through the wilderness where they formally entered into a covenant relationship with God and on into the promised land where they could live in service to God. And every year, during the first full moon of the year, the Israelites would celebrate their escape from Egypt. It spoke of their past, but it also spoke of their future. It told them, one day the seed of the woman will indeed crush the head of the serpent. Just as God has once defeated Egypt and its gods, so God will defeat all evil. And that's the feast that Jesus and the twelve were celebrating in our text. Celebrating it in a time of oppression and apostasy. Oppression because the Israelites weren't their own Rulers, they were ruled by the Romans. An apostasy, that means people had left worshiping God properly. The leadership of the priests, the scribes, the elders of the time, they were unfaithful to God. And the lay religious leadership, they're called the Pharisees and the scribes. They knew very well what was in the Bible, but they tended to be hypocrites. And so celebrating the Passover in this setting of oppression by the Romans and apostasy in, among God's people stirred in the hearts of the disciples a longing for the resurrection of Israel as a free nation truly serving God. 
And here they had among themselves the son of David, the crown prince, in, in Mark 11. That's the next slide. Um, we read how earlier that week Jesus had been hailed in Jerusalem with loud cries. We sang it with him 29. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of, of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. That was actually a quote from a song that the Jews would sing as the last song during the Passover celebration. Right after our text, you can read that they, they sang a hymn. That hymn would have been Psalm 118. But Jesus, Jesus celebrated the Passover with the true purpose in mind. Nothing to do with the Romans. Not just a celebration of a past liberation. Jesus knew that the Passover was a prophet of his own sacrifice it spoke of salvation of being set free of being liberated rescued from from sin from death from satan now do realize by the way jewish days they don't begin at midnight like our days do they begin when the sun goes down in Leviticus 23, God had commanded that the Israelites celebrate the Passover at twilight. So as one day becomes the next day. The Holy Spirit had marked note this. As evening came to pass. Not only does it actually point out how the Lord Jesus and, and the 12 disciples kept the Passover as prescribed. But it also tells us that the day of Christ's crucifixion had begun. At the end of the Passover celebration, they would sing, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. The day that Jesus would be crucified. We know it as Good Friday. But at the time of our text, the strife of the battle weighed heavily. The Lord Jesus and his disciples, they had a place to celebrate the Passover in. Probably the upper chamber in a house owned by John Mark's mother. That's what tradition suggests. Mark being the writer of the gospel that we read from. They had a private place just to be with the 13 of them. Here they could share a meal together. It's too bad, by the way, that in our Western culture, the function of a meal to express fellowship is not as strong as it is in Eastern and in Southern cultures. A close friend is someone you share bread with. That's how Psalm 41 verse 9 depicts it, if we could have that up. Even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread... It's also reflected, by the way, in, in one of the words we still have in English for a friend, a close friend. It's the word companion. Companion is, is simply the Latin word for sharing bread with. And sharing that most special of meals, the Passover supper, together with just the 13 of them in Jerusalem, it was an absolute highlight for the disciples. All the more as this was actually the first time it had ever happened. That they just celebrated it with the 13 of them. Here was companionship during the annual feast of liberation. And all of that is shattered by the most solemn declaration of Jesus. Amen. I'm telling you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. What? Oh, we'll get to the response of those who were sitting there in a moment. Realize that Jesus is speaking very generally. His point is not actually to uncover Judas as a betrayer. It does happen in the course of events, though even then the, the disciples, they didn't clue in at all. That Judas was the betrayer remained a mystery to them until that moment in the garden where Judas gives Jesus a kiss. Now, the point right now for Jesus is different. His declaration is an indication that nothing that will transpire on the day that's just begun 
will take him as the Son of Man by surprise. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. One of those things is Psalm 41. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. As the decisive battle with evil begins, Jesus, as the Son of Man, makes clear he knows exactly who his enemy is. He's not going to be taken by surprise. Nor is he looking to run away and escape what lies before him. Now, knowing what lies before him, he heads straight into the battle. He is the champion of God. Isaiah 9, mighty God. That also translates as God of heroicness. He is heading into the battle as his forefather David had once taken on Goliath. And in declaring one of the twelve to be his betrayer, the Son of Man expressed submission to the Father's plan. He began to walk the way of suffering. It's not going to be easy. The first arrow already pierces the loving heart of the Christ. It's one of the twelve. How lost is man's condition. That someone who has spent three years in the company of, in bread sharing with the Christ, should betray him. The contours of the battle were beginning to show. And as the Son of Man, Jesus the Christ knew exactly what was going to happen. And he went willingly. Willingly. Understand that. Christ's announcement is not so much a judgment of the betrayer. As a statement of his confidence. As he heads in to that most difficult time. It's an expression of his love. He'd been willing to put up with this betrayer for three years. He was willing to die for you, for me. The 12, let's go back to the theme and points. There's companionship during the annual feast of liberation. And all of that is shattered by Jesus' most solemn declaration. Amen, I'm telling you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. What? The twelve had learned to take Jesus seriously. They spent some three years with him. And when he said something that began with amen, they knew. That was a parallel to a prophet saying in the Old Testament, thus says the Lord. They didn't doubt the truth of God's word. While the unnamed and unknown betrayer is among them. There's no sense of, oh no, Jesus, no, you got this all wrong. But the twelve are disturbed. For the most part, they're true children of God. They were well aware of their own weaknesses. There were 11 there that that seriously doubted that they would betray Jesus. But they knew themselves well enough that it could happen. And it grieved them that there was a betrayer among them. One by one, they asked. It's not me, is it? One by one. Judas also joined the chorus. Actually, we know from Matthew's gospel that Judas was probably last. It would seem that the the questioning began with the disciple to Jesus' right. That would have been the apostle John, the disciple John. Then it would have jumped across the table to Simon Peter, who was sitting opposite or laying opposite John. And then it would have gone around the table until it reached Judas, who was actually on the left side of Jesus. And we know from Matthew's gospel that when Judas asked, it's not me, is it? That Jesus said to him, it's as you say. Like, yes, it's you. You know it. But everybody else that was there didn't clue in to what was going on. Just like they don't clue in to what we read about in John 13. Now, we've already noted that Jesus made a statement to express his own confidence as he heads into the decisive battle. And to assure his disciples that nothing is going to be happened by accident. Everything will happen as God determined it. But another reason is, is to display, to, to, to prove the naivety and limitations of us humans. Even men who had spent like three years with Jesus 
had not understood from the scriptures, from the writings of God, how the Son of Man would go. It never dawned on them that whenever they sang Psalm 41, that this was also about how Jesus would be betrayed by a companion. And a third reason is to reveal the hardness of Judas' heart. Understand well how low the humanity had, had sunk in rebelling against God. Judas allowed himself to be an instrument of Satan. To act as a seed of the serpent. So as to bruise the heel of the Christ. The division of, of humanity into those who are against God and those who belong God, to God that division ran straight through the group that was celebrating God's act of liberation. It's not me, is it? The disciples were brought into a moment of self-examination. It's good for us to always examine ourselves. A third thought, the determination of God. You do wonder, what's up with this Judas Iscariot? What would move an individual to betray Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David, the Christ of God? Well, given what we're told in Scripture, Judas Iscariot was a Jewish nationalist. His second name, Iscariot, is likely a merger of the Aramaic and Hebrew word for man, that's ish, matched with the Latin word sicarius, which means a man who uses a sica. And a sica, boys and girls, was a curved dagger. Iscariot literally translates as the man with a dagger. The English equivalent is assassin. Judas the assassin. We also know that this Judas was a very selfish man who loved money. He had managed to work his way somehow into the position of treasurer of Jesus and the disciples, and he would often siphon away the funds. Small wonder he was willing to betray Jesus for a sum of money. Judas was a criminal, a thief, and a murderer. And of him Jesus said, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. With that, the Lord Jesus made clear, Judas is completely responsible for his own actions. He was born to live for God. He was shown special privileges in being allowed to be one of the twelve. And yet, though he should have known better, he chose to betray Jesus. And so the guilt of his unbelief was his own. And God, God is so powerful and wise that he determined to use this Judas for his purpose. The wisdom literature in scripture tells us, could we have the next text up please? Proverbs 16. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. God sovereignly purposed Judas Iscariot to be the heel bite of the serpent. To be the instrument of Satan. To be the weapon of evil. Yes, the Son of Man would go as it was written of him. Now, it doesn't mean, by the way, that you can blame God now for what Judas did. We should realize that the other 11 were no better. When you read on in Mark 14, you'll see that even the leader of the disciples, Simon Peter, will go so far as to disown Jesus, just as Jesus knew on forehand. And the other ten, they all flee the moment Jesus is taken captive. But there is yet this question. Why? Why did it have to be one of the twelve? Why one of the closest friends of Jesus? Why one of his compassions? Well, it had to do with the pain that the Christ had to experience. Humanity 
betrayed the Savior sent by God. The Son of Man would experience the pain that God had experienced when we walked out on Him. And it also reflects back to the individual who incited the rebellion of humanity, Satan. The Apostle John notes emphatically, Judas was an instrument of Satan. Know this, before his rebellion against God, Satan also enjoyed fellowship with God. Also with God the Son. He was known as the day star, the son of dawn. That's, for those of you who like knowing these things, where the Latin name for Satan comes from, Lucifer, the light bringer. We read in one of the New Testament letters how Satan will masquerade as an angel of light. Masquerade. He knows how to do it, you see, because he used to be the angel of light. The fact that one from the inner circle of Christ's companions betrays him reflects the reality that one from the inner circle of God's servants rebelled against God. The highest angel and the two humans God had made. Judas Iscariot was actually an image bearer of Satan. And so this is all about Genesis 3 verse 15 again. Could we have that up? It's the battle of the seed of the serpent. Judas the assassin with the seed of the woman. Jesus of Nazareth. The Messiah. As the singer Michael Card once put it in his song, Why? Why did it have to be a friend who chose to betray the Lord? And why did he use a kiss to show them? That's not what a kiss is for. Only a friend can betray a friend. A stranger has nothing to gain. And only a friend comes close enough to ever cause so much pain. Salvation is through enmity. God has his plan. He had it when humanity rebelled and plunged itself into, into sin. And God's plan was being executed. His decree was being carried out. He revealed his plan throughout the ages. Jesus the Christ as the Son of Man understood it well. The Son of Man will go as it is written of him. Other humans, as the events happen, they're puzzled, they're troubled, they're perturbed. It wasn't for God's grace. We'd all have done what Judas did. Give up on Christ and make the most of it. But that's not to be. Salvation is through enmity. Could we go back to the last slide? Acknowledge, beloved, that everything happens according to God's plan. Also your own personal salvation. Your own relationship with God. Appreciate the suffering and the pain that the Christ experienced. And experience, appreciate it all the more. Realizing that Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen when. And he went on in obedience to the scriptures. And so in the suffering of Christ, observe the love of God and recognize salvation is in Christ alone. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, righteous Father, thank you for the good news of Christ we could hear. It kind of doesn't feel like good news. To hear how one of Christ's closest friends betrayed him. And as humans we hang our heads in shame. But it is good news. For Christ knew it. He knew exactly what would happen. And through whom things would happen. And how things would happen. And he went in obedience though he struggled much. He went as was written of him. What you had made known regarding him. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were prepared to set out on the road of suffering, difficult though it was. And we're encouraged by the fact that all things happened according to your plan, O Lord. And so we pray.
Continue to do as you have determined. Encourage us with your power and justice. Also as we prepare to celebrate the victory of Christ in his death and resurrection. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together from the psalm that speaks of our love for God and God's love for his own. And think again, too, of Christ himself singing this psalm. Psalm 116, 1, 2, 3, 9, and 10. We've heard good news, but the best is now. Receive the blessing of this mighty God and live in his peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>